Hello Redeemer family, I'm excited and glad to be able to send you this video from my dorm room in downtown Chicago while I'm studying here at the Moody Bible Institute. I'm super excited and thrilled to be able to go to and return to the Gospel of John, this gospel all about belief in Jesus and understanding that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, come for us, and we are called to believe in him and have faith in him for eternal life. Now, this the passage we're going to be going over tonight is John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. We have a lot to cover, and I'm going to be walking through this passage verse by verse instead of reading the whole thing so that we can um, go through it at a quicker pace and to not have as much confusion. So let's pray and get into it. Lord God, I thank you so much for all the stories, all the things that you have put in your word. The diversity of scripture is astounding and the lessons and the values and the things that you teach us about yourself, about how you work, about why you work and about yourself. These things are jaw dropping and we thank you for what you say about yourself. Help us to seek to understand our place, our position, better tonight and how best we can love and serve you. Amen. So beginning with John chapter 10, verse 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Now this is about a three month time skip from when we previously were it is now winter, and it is now this Feast of Dedication. Now, the Feast of Dedication is not something you'll find in the Old Testament. It's not one of the many Old Testament feasts that were commanded of the nation of Israel. But instead, this Feast of Dedication has come about during the intertestamental period, the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is a feast remembering the acts of Judas Maccabeus and his rebellion against the tyrant Antiochus Epiphanes as um, Antiochus was ruling over the Jews and oppressing them, not just physically, but especially religiously and attacking their faith and desecrating the temple by putting statues of Zeus up in, this tem in the temple of God. And so because of all of this oppression, specifically the religious oppression, Judas Maccabeus and his brothers rallied together and attacked and took over the temple and were able to cleanse it of all the, the desecration and rededicated it to God and had this big feast and festival celebrating their dedication to God. That is why it's called the Feast of Dedication. We know this feast today as Hanukkah is uh, what the Jews still practice today, remembering the rebellion against tyrants who have oppressed them. And this was the sentiment that the Jews had during this time, this desire for rebellion, this remembering of a successful rebellion that was able to uh, lift their spirits and lift their dedication to God. Currently, they were under the thumb of Rome, currently being in our passage. They were under the, the thumb of Rome and desiring rebellion, desiring freedom from it. And then we have this question brought to Jesus. So the Jews gathered around Jesus and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. During this time, they were seeking the Christ. They all, everyone knew, all the Jews knew about the Christ, the Messiah, the one to save their people. And their desires were for this military rebellion against the governments that, and rulers that were oppressing them. So going into this question, they have a wrong idea of who the Christ is. So they ask Jesus who, if he is the Christ, but they have a very wrong idea of what that means. And they ask him to tell him if he was the Christ 
but he has already made it very clear through his teachings and his miracles that he is the Christ. Many of Jesus' miracles included the miracle of faith and belief in Jesus as the Messiah and as the Christ. And yet, these Jewish leaders looking on still do not believe. And Jesus calls them out. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. Jesus has told them, said that, I and the Father are one. We are, are equal. We are equal in, in love and l rulership and authority and all of these things. That I am, the, I am his son, his only begotten son. And if you have seen God, if you have seen the Father, if you have seen me. And all these amazing statements about Jesus' relationship as God. And Jesus says that these people have been told, but they do not believe. And he says that the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. Beyond just what he says, the fact that his miracles and his works are done in the name of his father also bear witness about him. And then he explains that you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. And sheep, if I hope that will prick your ears of what was talked about last Sunday, because sheep was what the whole passage was about, what it meant to be a sheep, um, one of Jesus's sheep, and what it looked like to be uh, a sheep in his fold, entering through the sheep gate, and not to be one of the thieves to come in. And he, he tells that those people who do not believe in Jesus, who are unable to see and to understand that Jesus has been saying that he's the Christ. Jesus has been showing that he is the Christ. Everything about his ministry, about his fulfillment of prophecy, about what people say about him, about the reaction response to those who uh, receive miracles from, from Jesus, what they witness and testify about Christ. All these things testify that Jesus is the Christ. And people who cannot see that, these people here asking Jesus to tell them plainly, they are not his sheep. They do not believe. What they are seeking is a reason to kill him. They desire Jesus to say statements that will get him in trouble. Say, say that plain confession almost of your deity, of your equality with God. Say, say that, that you're the Christ because we don't, we don't really believe you and we truly want, we don't believe in you and we want a reason to kill you. We know that this simple idea of Jesus claiming to be God is all that was needed for the Jewish leaders to put Jesus to death. As in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, um, when he is brought before the Jewish council, the council of elders there, um, after being taken from the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane um, he is brought before them and they ask him, are you the son of God? And Jesus says, you say that I am. And they say, what further testimony do we need? And then they seek to put bring him before Pilate and put him to death. They're just looking for just one statement about him going a little too far in their eyes so that then they can have an excuse to kill him. Verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Now, these statements about Jesus's relationship with his sheep 
is really amazing. It teaches us a lot about the process of salvation and, and what that looks like in detail. He lays out his relationship with his sheep. First off, in verse 27, he says that his sheep hear his voice. He has established who his sheep are. He knows his sheep. There are many sheep. There are many people. But Jesus has his own sheep. He has elected his sheep and he knows them. We have the doctrine of election shown here. He calls out to his sheep. He acts. And only his sheep truly hear Jesus. Christ knows them. He speaks to them. And his sheep hear. This is the, the doctrine of, of limited atonement. That though he, he calls out only his sheep hear. He just said that the everyone else um, has been told that Jesus is the Christ, but they do not believe. Only Jesus' Jesus's sheep know and believe. He says that his sheep follow him and that Jesus, I give them eternal life. The doctrine of, of irresistible grace happening, happening here where God gives them eternal life. It's not something that, that they choose. It's not something that they decided to, that they listened to and decided that they were going to follow. No, it's God acting and giving eternal life. And then verse 28 this amazing statement here that they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand jesus saying that my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand so when talking about then the doctrine of irresistible grace that god that jesus's sheep are known by Jesus, elected by him, called out to by him effectively so that they know, they follow Jesus and God and Jesus gives them eternal life and then secures it so that none of, they will not perish and that they will not be snatched out of his hand. Jesus is promising this. He says that God, his father, is promising this. And we know that the spirit is, we hear from Paul the apostle, that the spirit of God is this further seal of our salvation. So we have this so firm grip of Jesus and God and the spirit working together to protect, to keep, to hold, and to work through his sheep it's amazing an amazing picture an amazing amount of security that jesus shows for his sheep and then he concludes this statement about what it means about about his relationship with his sheep about who sheep are the ones who listen to Jesus, the ones who are his, who have always been his, the ones who Jesus knows, cares for, calls out for, and then secures and protects. He then concludes this statement by saying, I and the Father are one. Now, the people around knew exactly what Jesus was saying by saying, I and the Father are one. He has said that I and the Father are, are equal, that we are the same, and all of these statements build this idea. And the, him saying, Jesus saying, that I am God. And the people around him knew that this was saying, that he was saying this, because immediately they picked up stones again to stone him. This is not the first time that the people have tried to stone Jesus for claiming 
to be God. And you, you gotta love, you, you gotta love what Jesus says after this. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? In the face of all these people picking up stones, desiring to kill the Son of God, Jesus says, So, of all the good things I've done you, which one of them makes you want to kill me? <laughs> Jesus, uh, <laughs> maybe this was my, my reading of it and not how it actually was, but uh, you gotta love it. Then the Jews answered, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now they kind of got it confused. It's really the opposite that God took on the form of man. That he took on humanity. It wasn't humanity taking on God, but it was God dwelling with man. Now we get to a kind of complicated argument from Jesus. These people are ready to kill him. They are ready to kill him for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. But then Jesus speaks and they listen. They stop what they're doing. Their, their rage and their wrath is kept at bay for just a little bit because of the power of Jesus' words. Jesus answered them. For, uh, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father." So this, this argument is a little bit complex and should be, be understood properly because when we hear that, that Jesus says, is it not written and said in your law that you are gods? If you, okay, we need to understand what Jesus is referencing here first. And he is, is clearly referencing Psalm 82, where in the, the Psalm, um, those who are judges of God are call, called gods. They're given this high title of authority of being put on this high level. So these people who are supposed to be, um, who are judges of, on behalf of God, are called gods. Of course, in that psalm, um, it is their wickedness is, is shown and how they're called gods and they're given this high title, but in fact, they, um, they do not follow. But so Jesus establishes that there is a high title that is given to, to you. It is written in your law that, that you are gods, that there is th this high title given to judges of God, given to those to whom the word of God came, as verse 35 says. So the word of God has come to those who are judges of God. And these and the people right now are seeking to be judges of God, judging one someone to be blaspheming God. This is the role that they are taking. So the word ha of God has come to these people. They believe in the word of God. And yet they do not recognize or believe in the one who is called the son of God. They do not believe in him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world. They do not believe that the works and the things that Jesus is doing is of God. Jesus says that if I'm doing things that is not of God, then don't believe me, and then you have every right to stone me. But because I am claiming to be the Son of God, 
and my works and the things I do do not contradict that. You who are given this high authority of judges on behalf of God, to whom the word of God has been given, you still don't understand or you should understand that I am rightfully the son of God and that my claims about being one with the father is totally justified because of my works that you should believe and there's no reason for you to claim to call blasphemy in this situation however unfortunately the people did not truly understand the word of god which has been revealed to them. They did not properly understand the Old Testament and the prophecies and the heart of God to save his people in a deep and intimate way. And they did not believe Jesus because they're not his sheep. It's ironic that the word that Jesus uses, this argument that the word of God has come to you, has been revealed to you, the Jewish people, but it is ironic that they did not believe in the incarnate word of God. It's quite sad. And again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Jesus is able to escape from them. They did not believe, but Jesus still says it. And I think one of the one of the most important things we get from this this passage is just this this little thing that that shows Jesus's respect for Scripture, because his, his argument is based on this pretty much singular word or phrase from the the Psalms that Jesus Jesus holds such a high respect for Scripture that he is taking this this phrase and using it in his argument using it as something that that speaks to why he is god and he has this great phrase um, in verse 35 that scripture cannot be broken when you think of what what should we think of inerrancy and how how much value should we give the word of God. How much value should we give scripture? What things should we trust? Are there any things we should throw out or de-emphasize? We should look to what Jesus thought about scripture. And Jesus says that scripture cannot be broken and uses a small part of scripture to great effect. That there is no piece of scripture that should be thrown out should be tossed away or that is ever broken or useless jesus respects scripture greatly but it unfortunately does not have an effect on the crowds they do not believe they do not believe so in verse 40, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained. And many came to him and said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That is what John's claim of Jesus was. And the people saw that, heard that, and remembered that. And knowing the works of Jesus, believed. They listened to John and they saw the things that Jesus had, had done. And they believed. There are tons. There are many things that, that John likely said that, that we just do not have written down. All of his sermons and all of the time he spent preaching and preparing 
the way for Jesus. We don't have all that written down, but we know that what he said was very powerful and it led to these people who believed in the words of John, who believed, who then believed in Jesus because of what Jesus has done. Jesus, John said some very interesting things. Uh, one, of, one of them that's kind of comical is that Jesus said, uh, John said that, that Jesus was before him, had existed before John, that he was to be valued over John because he has existed before John. But you know that John was born before Jesus. That's very strange saying that of your cousin, saying my younger cousin has existed before me and my younger cousin is God. <laughs> It's kind of crazy. But these people recognize the sincerity and the truth of it because they are Jesus' sheep. They hear because they have been known. They have been claimed. They have been set apart by Jesus. And they follow because Jesus has called them. And Jesus gives them eternal life and will prevent them from perishing. Now, John wants belief in the true Jesus, the, the gospel writer that is. He wants belief in the true Jesus. So then the question for us is, do we believe in the true Jesus? Do we believe that he is the Christ or do we have a wrong idea of what the Christ is? Is Jesus the one to, to save us, to transform our lives, to free us, free us from, from lives dedicated to the flesh? Instead, as Romans um, 8 says, for us to be dedicated to living by the Spirit. Are we sheep who listen to Jesus' voice? Do we follow and seek to obey the call to know Christ as deeply as he knows us? It's an impossible thing for us to achieve, but we are called to grow in the nurture and admonition of God, to seek to understand scripture better and better, do our works and the things that we do bear witness of Christ? Jesus, that was Jesus' main argument of the things that Jesus does affirm him and show him to be the true Christ. And something that can cause belief. Do our works bear witness to Christ? Do we act as sheep of the good shepherd? Do we live as those who have been indwelt by the spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead? Do we, it's important to realize and to know that, that we need to rely on and seek to follow Jesus in every part of our lives and to seek to understand what that means even means to understand in every aspect of our life that we need to be honoring and following Jesus in every mundane moment. When you wake up, when you go to sleep, how you wake up, how you go to sleep, how you eat, drink, or whatever you do, doing it for the glory of God, working and acting in a way that shows Jesus, that shows who our good shepherd is. So examining the small acts that we do for the sake of, of knowing God better and living truly as one who believes.
in Jesus. Let's pray. God, you are good, and your mercies endure forever. Allow us to see your presence in our lives, to see the ways that you have worked, the ways that you are working, and the ways that you will work. We thank you, God, that no one will snatch us out of the hands of Jesus. No one will snatch us out of the hands of God our Father. We thank you for the sealing and indwelling power of the Holy Spirit keeping us secure. Help us to have confidence in that and to be thankful that no matter what comes our way, we have a good Father, a gracious and loving Son, and a Spirit who unifies us together. Amen.